Hello, it's Dr. Alan Yim. Tonight, I'm going to be explaining how to analyze a minuet. The first thing you should do when you're going to analyze a minuet is to listen to the music. So I have the score here. We're not going to take the time to listen to it. You can go on your own and, and listen to this piece. I'm going to give you the, the overall steps for doing this. So after you listen to the piece and read through it, you should look at the overall big picture. How many sections are there in the entire minuet? Then inside of those sections, you're going to see smaller sections. How many sections inside of those sections? What are the keys? What are the cadences? How many phrases and how are they related? And what is the structure of these phrase relationships? Okay, we're going to take this step by step. So we're going to start off with the most basic part, which is how many sections are in the piece. So here's the piece again. This is the entire minuet. It's the second movement in a Haydn piano sonata. So you can see here that it is divided into what looks like two sections, the minuet and the trio. But you should notice down here that it says M D capo. Okay, so what does that mean? It means minuet da capo. Go back and play the minuet all over again. So it turns out that it really is A B A. This is a ternary form because you're going you're going to play this the minuet, then the trio, then the minuet. So the overall form is ternary. The next question then is how many sections are inside of the minuet and inside of the trio. Um, so let's take a look at that. It's not too difficult to see this because there's a repeat sign in both of these that divides it up. So you know there's at least two sections. And most of these pieces are either going to have binary or ternary sections. So um, overall, we can see here, it looks like it begins with a certain pattern then it changes slightly. How do I know it changes? Well, in the beginning, it has this little theme and you, you listen to it, you can hear it. And then in the B. So it, it changes enough that I'm going to call it something different. And then A comes back again. You should listen to the beginnings and the ending of each section to see whether they are the same or different. So I'm going to compare the two A sections so I can tell by looking the first A section ends in the melody with a little trill and the second one ends they're very similar but they have um, different keys and they are different enough because of that that we're going to call the second one A prime it's a variation of A in the trio we again have three big sections. Again, look for the repeat sign, and then you call this section A, then it changes to something different. Looks pretty similar. All right, but again, through listening, you could kind of tell that, that they're different. And then here again, A prime comes back. It looks exactly the same, except again, the ending is different. It ends in a different key. These cadences are sort of um, typical they, if you look at the last bar of each cadence, there's only the octave, so you don't even get the third, which kind of helps, I think, to make the transition into the next section. If they had a more full chord, some of these uh, transitions might be a little bit more bumpy. For example, from the A section here in the minuet to the B, it goes from um, G major to G minor, and that might be a little bit more jarring if you had the third in here. Let's go ahead. So... Those are the main sections. We're going to number these so we can put them in a diagram. So I numbered the measures here. When you number a piece, you could just put the number for the first system. You don't need to number every single measure, uh, that which would take a lot of time. Now notice I numbered the trio, oh sorry, the minuet, and then the trio separately. So I started with one in each one. I also started on the first full measure. I don't count the pickup. And then when I get over here, because this could be a little bit confusing, it's six, seven, eight. Eight goes over the bar line, and this is measure nine. So you can see I continue. I don't go 
eight and then nine. So don't count half measures like that. The same structure happens in the trio. There's a pickup. One is the first full measure, then six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then bar ten goes again over the bar line, and eleven is the first full measure in the B section. This is what the structure looks like once I put in the big letter names A, B, A with the measure numbers. And when you make your diagram, be sure to put in the repeat signs. So this is the basic structure of each. It's really clear. You can see the ternary form once you lay it out like this. Okay, let's go on. So inside the minuet, the trio, there are three sections. It's ternary form for each. Now we're going to look at the keys and the cadences. This is maybe where it starts getting a little bit trickier. So starting with the key, the first thing you should look at, of course, are the key signatures and possibly the cadences. Try to get the overall big picture of the keys. So here are some hints for finding the keys. Of course, you want to listen to it. And then I mentioned, look at the key signatures. Look for accidentals. If there are no accidentals, you're pretty sure that you're in major. Uh, it, the, it should be obvious. The key should be obvious. Look for tonicizations. If you start seeing a bunch of accidentals, then look for five ones at the ends of phrases. Always look at the beginnings and the ends of the phrases. What are the chords on the main beats? Because again, they're probably going to be one or maybe five. Okay, try singing it. Where's Do? Okay, so let's say you know the pieces in C and you sing Do and it turns out that you're singing C. Well, then you know what key you're in. That might be helpful. Okay, let's go back and look now at the keys that I've identified. So it's clearly in C major at the beginning and you could see the chords. Okay, so on the downbeat, it's C and there's a passing and C. So the first two bars are C. You pretty much know there's no trickery going on here and there's no accidentals. But then you start seeing F sharp. F sharp, of course, is not in the key of C. That looks like we're going to the dominant. And I would guess that over here, we are going into the key of G. I put G over here. Actually, over here, it looks like already we're kind of going into G here because again, Look on the downbeat and you see a G major chord right after that F sharp. So I'm going to move that G over there. And then we would, if it's in G, we're ending on a PAC. And you can listen for it and see if you think it's a PAC. If not, you might put a half cadence there. I think it's a PAC. I hear that as in the key of G. Okay, then as we go into the B section, immediately something funny happens. And it go, looks like it goes to G minor. And then we have this diminished chord and immediately we see G7. If, if there's a, a seventh chord on G, well, we can no longer be in the key of G. So this looks like it, we've immediately gone back to C and it remains in C for the rest of the minuet. In the trio, well, there's a key change and it's clear that it goes to the parallel minor, C minor, but it it's not completely confirmed because when you hear it, so he does, he has a 4-1 inverted. So it's 4 six, one, six. It's pretty ambiguous sounding. And then he kind of does what he did in the minuet. He does the dominant of G minor. get there you're pretty sure you're in G minor um, but it happens after we expect C minor at least from the looks of it now as the piece goes on and you're listening the, it immediately goes back <laughs> into C minor okay so there it is again a G7 and then one 
So you immediately get five, one, and again. And then, then the G starts sounding like a half cadence, and that phrase is repeated. Sort of like, very similar to the minuet, it follows the same kind of key structure, briefly going into the dominant, or in the case of this one, the minor dominant, and then back to the tonic key. So what does that look like in um, if we actually diagram it? It looks like this. Okay, so here... I've put the cadences and the keys. So they kind of go together, hand in hand. It's, it's sort of hard to um, find the cadences without knowing what key you're in. And it's also easy to find the key once you know the cadences. All right, so, so here I've labeled them all. And maybe interesting to note that some of these things look like a period structure where the second phrase is stronger and in other cases, they aren't. So you might start thinking about how are these phrases related in terms of structure. All right, so we have the answer here. The minuet is in C and G major. The trio is in C and G minor. The cadences used are perfect authentic cadences, imperfect authentic cadences, and half cadences. I should point out something else about these um, cadences, and that is the PACs, and I'm going to get rid of this, or HC, because I really don't think it's a half cadence. But if you notice, the first time in A and in A prime, there's a difference, even though they're both perfect. Okay, so the first one, notice, so we have contrary motion between the bass and the soprano, but it's re do in the soprano. At the end, he does ti do. Whoops. Okay, I have to remember to change key. So, versus. So, ti do, I think, is stronger um, because it has the leading tone in it, whereas this one does not have the leading tone. These are small little touches that really uh, uh, these master composers, I guess you would say, put into their music and, it, and they're subtle, but they really make the difference between something that's good and something that's really great, even in a simple piece like this. Okay, and you notice the parallel thing happens in the trio, re do versus ti do there. Okay, you could look for other things that make the piece stand out a little bit more than the ordinary. And this is a very early uh, minuet for Haydn, so this is a pretty simple one. And still it has these, these details. Now we're going to look at how the phrases are related and how many phrases there are, which you could probably already kind of um, predict. So a reminder, a phrase is a complete musical idea that ends in a cadence. We'll talk about the cadences soon. Uh, most of the phrases are four measures long. This is just a general statement. Most phrases are four measures long is kind of what we expect. Odd numbers are less expected. So if you, if you write a phrase that's three measures or five measures long, you're going to throw off the listener probably a little bit. They're not going to be expecting that. They expect even numbers, two, four, maybe six. You see that the second section in the Trio is 10, so they have 10 measure phrases. When you're listening for these things, just like when you're speaking, listen for where the melody stops or pauses. So you'll notice, especially in the trio, that it's just steady eighth notes until there's a kind of a stop on a longer valued note. That's how you can tell where the music, the phrases begin and end. There's often this rest, uh, rest or a breath. Fermatas can also indicate the end of a phrase, especially in things like a Bach chorale, where maybe the phrase ends on beat three. He puts a fermata. Okay, as far as the cadences go, you, this is just a reminder of what they are. Perfect authentics, 5-1 in root position with the soprano ending on do. Imperfect authentic, anything else, 5-1 inverted or soprano not ending on do, or a diminished 7 going to 1. Half ends on five, 
deceptive ends on six, five going to six. Anything that has the leading tone and then doesn't go to one is pretty much deceptive. Plagal, it's not really used for cadences. You see this chord progression, this is the only other chord that normally goes to one, and that's the four chord in major, but that's the amen cadence, we call it plagal, but you wouldn't normally end a phrase with four ones, it's pretty weak, okay? And why is it weak? Well, there's no leading tone. Composers did not use that for ending a piece or a big section. Now, when listening for phrase relationships, this is how the phrases go together. Uh, the things you should listen for, the melodic and the rhythmic ideas, motives, they can be very short, but something that you recognize that's repeated, varied, or put together with something that contrasts. The texture of each phrase. So what is texture? Well, things could be played in unison, monophonically. They could be chordal, like a four-part texture, or it could be homophonic with chords and bass with a melody. You might have a two-part texture, a three-part texture. So any changes in texture make the relationships between the phrases change. Methods of variation. Making the phrases longer or shorter. Changing the octave or the key where it begins or ends. Adding ornamentation. Reharmonizing a melody. And again, I mentioned the texture. Okay. We're going to now look at the, at the phrase structure of this minuet and trio. So it looks something like this. I put the ones that are similar in sort of the same shade, like orange and yellow, uh, or purple and this kind of magenta color. And then as you can see in the trio, I put the B section in a completely contrasting color. Maybe it should be something closer, but I just wanted you to be able to see the difference there. Let's start from the very beginning the, at the minuet. Okay, so, and then the second phrase, notice it has this little bit of a kind of a feminine ending. It ends on a weak beat. Okay, so the second phrase ends directly on the downbeat. It's a lot stronger than this. He could have done this. Something, but it wouldn't have sounded a little bit weird. So by ending that first phrase on B2, it links directly into the second phrase. Um, I hope you agree that these are different enough that I could put A and B, even though they start and it's just a little bit different enough. And then, okay, B section. Okay. Now, there could be some controversy about whether we should call that a variation of A or B, but I am going to call that C only because the melody is pretty distinctive. What's what's linking these all together is the rhythm, obviously. Okay, same thing for D. This is obviously different. It's, even though it has the same rhythm, it's very different. And then, of course, we go back to A. This um, second A is exactly the same as the first. And then the B, that is... Um, slightly varied from the first B, it ends in a different key, so we're going to call that B prime. And those are all those phrases. Now, in the trio, it's a little bit trickier because this is sort of like looking like a sentence because because there's no real good cadence until you get to the end. Now, it again, I mentioned that this first part sounds like C minor, but that's that kind of inverted four, one, and this one here, 
it almost seems like it's trying to do one five one, but um, the one is a one six four. So not even sure if it's worth calling that any even a chord. It's almost like a, a harmonization. So we're gonna leave those sixths alone and we're gonna call this a sentence. Same thing for with the return, the A prime at the bottom. It begins the same, but at the end, it has to change so that we can stay in C minor. Now, what about the B section? This is so clearly something different, right? Because the texture, this is what I mean by texture. The left hand does no longer sits out like it did in the A section, but it has kind of a drone on the dominant. So it's basically, this whole thing is just five. So even though I did put half cadence there, really this whole B section is just five. And um, yeah, it, it doesn't progress anywhere. It's just sitting on the dominant. Okay. All right. That's the structure of the phrases. And in the B section, um, I'm almost hesitant to put an A prime there. I could almost put just A, but there is enough of a difference maybe it's, you know, it's subtle. You don't, it doesn't really matter if you put A, A or A prime the second time. That's the first ending. And the other one is, it's really the same. So if you put A and then another A like this, I don't think that would really matter. Okay, so A, A prime or A and another A, it's fine. You just kind of wrote out the repeat with a variation. Okay, this is what the phrase structure looks like then. I just basically put these letters in here. Okay, so I put, and the X, oh, I, I could have put it, oh, and I didn't even put the X over here. Okay, so over here is this X, X prime. It should say the same thing here. Um, these outer A sections in the minuet, these are contrasting periods. Okay, why? Well, the two phrases are they go together and the second phrase ends on a stronger cadence than the first so that's a period structure here half cadence pac here iac pac the middle phrase is not a period structure because you can see the second phrase ends with a weaker cadence okay and the minua and the trio the outer sections are sentences and the B section really is just a repeated phrase. It's not, uh, there's no phrase structure here really. It's just a repeated phrase. Maybe you could say the second one's slightly varied. So answering these questions, how many phrases? The first one, the minuet has six. The trio has four. How are they related? Well, the minuet has this four sixteenth note pickup for every phrase followed by a quarter note. I'll go back and show you. And the trio has steady eighth notes, except at the cadences. So going back and looking at that, notice. You know, okay, so every one of these phrases starts the same way, which could be a little bit confusing as in terms of following the form. And when you see other Haydn pieces, they do have rather, um, ambiguous sometimes structures. Over here, steady eighth notes in the sentence until the very end. And notice, slower, 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 and then stop. Same thing here, stop, stop. And then here at the end, there's a little tiny stop here, and then another stop. But, but that helps you to recognize where the, the phrases begin and end, those rhythms, and it ties it all together. What is the structure of the phrase relationship? Well, I went over that. So the two, two contrasting periods, the B section has two contrasting phrases, but they're not a period structure. In the trio, two sentences in the A, and the B is just a repeated phrase. Lastly, some details to that you may, we talked about before. Both the minuet and trio are continuous because they change key at the 
when they get to the repeat sign, so you have to continue. To reprise, they both, all the sections repeat, and ternary form. The minuet's balanced and the trio's unbalanced. The minuet has all eight major sections, eight major, well, the A, B, A that are balanced. The trio has 10 bars, and then let me remember what this is. So 10 bars on the first section, then eight, and then eight here. So it's a little bit unbalanced. Okay, that's it for this analysis. Go back and listen to the minuet, follow along with the music, and see if you can understand everything that I said. Then go out and look at your own minuet or scherzo and do your best to kind of follow along in these steps, and I think you'll be successful.